And it was a challenge for me to think of an appropriate talk for this. Uh, I didn't want to be too technical. And uh, this is something that has been um, uh, in my mind, churning in my mind for a very long time, that there are a bunch of contradicting paradigms. Uh, and I thought uh, uh, with uh, Hurricane Michael hitting us earlier uh, last month, uh, this would be a very appropriate uh, talk here. So landfalling tropical uh, cyclones, a time to reflect on the contradicting paradigms. What am I going to talk about? In the last two decades, we have had, uh, except for the 1992 case of Andrew, we have had the 10 costliest tropical cyclones hitting us in the United States. Uh, and this is a record over about 117 or 120 years uh, of data. And as, best, as we can go uh, in the past, uh, we see that this is rather revealing uh, that the most damaging tropical cyclones are happening when we are most technologically advanced. We are far more educated than probably we think the uh, past civilizations have ever been, or at least we pride ourselves in that uh, more very often. If you look at the landfalling tri tropical cyclone alley, uh, you see the highest frequency of landfalling tropical cyclones in this circle region, at least in the last uh, three, four decades. And Florida seems to be the headquarters of these landfalling tropical cyclones besides the Carolina coast over there. And then if you go further west, the Gulf Coast is also equally vulnerable but uh, Florida does uh, stare out of this diagram. And if you look at the uh, population change in the U.S. counties, we are uh, constantly seeing a migration of population from the inland counties uh, to the coastal counties constantly. So we are there in the crosshairs of this uh, landfalling tropical cyclones. So despite the fact that we live in a so-called hurricane alley, uh, there is a constant uh, influx of population uh, to these very uh, vulnerable areas. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, several of these talking points. I, I feel as though the technological advance is costing us. It uh, improved scientific understanding is costing us. Aggressive scientific investigations is costing us. Human in development index is costing us. Democracy is also probably costing us. And yet, and more, and I'll talk about that in the end. If I go back in time, going back to 15th century when the first uh, humidity measurements were made, hygrometer uh, by Leonardo da Vinci through uh, the discovery of telegraph by Graham Bell and the rest. Uh, we have made constant gradual progress in the scientific advancement. But I would like to talk about the advancement we have made in the last three or four decades in the era of satellites. We had we launched the first polar orbiting satellite, which is a low altitude satellite. And the first satellite that was launched in 1960 was basically taking a bunch of pictures from the top and sending it down. So. <coughs> We have made tremendous progress ever since. We now have these geosynchronous weather satellites which stare at one part of the globe constantly. And so we have a very high temporal resolution. We have now, uh, we track clouds, winds, we derive a number of other meteorological parameters including surface winds, surface salinity, surface temperatures, and so on and so forth. So there's a continuous watch of global weather patterns and uh, the advancement is so good that uh, our observational power has increased tremendously. Over the years, a uh, lot many countries have launched these satellites and so, uh, and these countries do cooperate and share the data to a large extent and so we are able to monitor the weather systems in real time constantly and so it is hard to fathom missing out on any storms. In the past, for example, if the tropical cyclones were out in the open ocean, unless someone really observed it from a ship, uh, it was very hard to detect. But now that era is gone, we can observe every developing tropical cyclone. And so, so our observational powers have certainly improved. We are launching constellations of satellites and constantly measuring them both from low altitude as well as from high altitude satellites.
and constantly we are uh, doing some uh, tremendous amount of technological advance to improve the sensors, uh, to make it cheaper to launch satellites and such. So the progress is still continuing. Uh, so that's regarding uh, the observational power. But in terms of modeling, modeling these tropical cyclones, uh, we have constantly improved in forecasting uh, these tropical cyclones. So if you look over these decades from 1960 to 2010, we have reduced the track errors of forecasting uh, these tracks by as much as 400 miles. We used to make, on an average, a track error of 400 miles in a 72-hour forecast, for example, a three-day forecast. Now we have reduced it to less than uh, or close to 150 miles. So we have constantly improved our models. We have made it far more reliable in terms of track forecast. Likewise, even in intensity forecast, at least for the 48 hours, we are constantly improving our intensity. We, I mean, there's a lot to realize in terms of the fidelity of these models, in terms of uh, predicting the intensity of tropical cyclones. But nonetheless, we are doing uh, significantly well, even in this metric. Now, <coughs> I was not aware, but there is something called, uh, uh, there was a GPRA, uh, 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 what is it called, government, I, I keep forgetting these acronyms. Uh, it's called the Government Performance and Results Act that was published in, or it was passed by the Congress in 1983. And so these federal agencies are given targets uh, every uh, or five years or ten years and uh, the National Hurricane Center has achieved a target that was to be in achieved in 2021 they've already achieved in 2017 in terms of the accuracy of the forecast so there has been a very aggressive uh, scientific investigation and we have all contributed it's not just National Hurricane Center the independent investigators in universities and institutions like these have all contributed aggressively to advance our models to improve and reach the goals passed by the Congress here so we are almost five years ahead of the curve here so we are aggressively pursuing and improving our models to improve the forecast so where am I leading all this? So let me also talk about the Human Development Index. This was developed by the United Nations. It is a, a parameter which gives you health, education, and wealth all in one index. And if you look at uh, this, uh, if you arrange some of the states of uh, US as a country, Florida ranks as ninth in the Human Development Index. So. Technologically, we are good. I mean, we, our human development index is ninth in the world if Florida was considered to be a country. And uh, democracy. So I was driving back from uh, office one uh, evening, and I was tuned into NPR, and there was this sh show called This Hour on Pond by Tom Ashbrook. And uh, there were a bunch of panelists uh, the mayor uh, of Miami 11 came out with a statement in that Miami City is viable and livable for the next 500 years. He was trying to promote the city of Miami. It's a great place to do business. Mayor Levin refutes Miami could be like Venice and says it's a Baba Meister, apparently uh, a Jewish term, which says it's absolutely not true. They were talking with the Dutch people, they were getting these pumps, and they were drawing in, uh, pumping out the water. And in that panel, there were a couple of climate scientists as well. And you, I, I would urge you all to listen to this archive. They were all dancing around the fence because they had to promote that Miami was viable, right? It's a democracy. I mean, if you are not able to create growth, if you are not able to promote growth, then you are out of the office, right? So uh, you can see, uh, and I was just wondering, if I were in his shoes, I would probably do the same thing, just as a job security thing, right? So it becomes really difficult uh, uh, to, and then, uh, in the same show, they have this Renzo Piano, apparently a very famous architect, is designing an 87 park residential tower, which is already underway in Miami Beach. And the price per square foot of that apartment is $1,600. So I looked up on the web, it is a real thing. And this is how it looks like, and this is what the interior would look like, 
right? Now, I'm sure that he's not the only builder or the architect who is building it there. A couple of weeks ago, I was at St. Pete, and I was aghast by the amount of built infrastructure right by the coast, right? Now, it is an engineering marvel. It is an architectural marvel. It is a great scientific progress done there. But you should also comment on the great minds that have gone into developing financial instruments, three, uh, uh, financial instruments threat assessment tools and such, which have gone in. And obviously, this was not constructed in ether because there are customers lined up to uh, go into these apartments. So certainly, we are living in an era where from Houston to Portland, Maine, uh, we are developing the coast like gangbusters, right? And, and, and you can see that 40% of our population is residing there, and the growth is inevitable. Uh, the, and the scientific understanding that we gain is emboldening people to go further and take the risk even further, right? So uh, I, I feel we live in a sort of a contradiction. So, and yet, again, I come back to this slide that if you look at the damage in the last few decades, it is the highest in the last uh, 120 years or so. If you look at the fatalities, that have not reduced either. I mean, look at Hurricane Maria. We have over uh, close to uh, 3,000 uh, deaths from that uh, uh, tropical cyclone landfall. If you look at Hurricane Irma, uh, there were about half a dozen tragic deaths in the nursing home. And I was just wondering, with the fact that the number of dwelling units, the licenses that are given out to dwelling units in Florida is one of the highest. And now uh, that. Uh, a tragedy that happened with Irma was in a nursing home where they were all collected in one building. Now, if you have individual dwelling units where you have senior people where the power is shut off, uh, you could have deaths in isolated dwelling units, unlike in, in a nursing home where they were all collected together. So uh, the tragedies could be, unto, uh, could be well beyond our imagination in a future uh, 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 built-in infrastructure of the coastal counties. So uh, dwelling units are increasing in the coastal watersheds in Florida and across actually the entire uh, seaboard, uh, eastern seaboard. If you look at the demography changes, certainly uh, the migration to the coastal communities is increasing significantly. And in fact, uh, I've just found out from this NOAA coastal population report that the senior population is increasing by over 80% and uh, sorry, by 208% in Florida. That's a huge, huge number that we are putting in the crosshairs of this uh, environmentally uh, catastrophic events. So in conclusion, I'm not offering any solutions here. I'm just acknowledging the conflicting paradigms. We are constantly being put on the cliff to uh, innovate, discover, but that's being also exploited and being and we are bringing these civilizations on the crosshairs of, um, of environmental uh, catastrophes. And certainly the rising aspirational levels from anthropology to zoology is just beyond control right at the moment. The ho horse has already bolted out of the barn and it is, there's no way to stop it. I mean, we are constantly going to be innovating, discovering, and emboldening the people to go closer to the ocean and we'll make sure that we have financial instruments that you can probably uh, get out of your bedroom window and walk into the boat ramp and off into the ocean. Thank you.